first lesson or session on parenting. So Pat had mentioned uh, the Sunday after Father's Day, the last Sunday in June. He talked about not exasperating your children and about not how do we, how do we uh, live with our children in such a way that we do not frustrate them, especially in their pursuit of the Lord. And we talked about it a little bit, and, and we believe that there's certainly enough not covered that we could do probably another four sermons, but I think right now we're just planning one, and this is it. So, as we consider the role of parenting, I would like for us to look at a few primary verses about the biblical role that parents are called to. The Bible has many instructions for parents, but I grabbed two Old Testament verses that I think captures the essence of parenting. Now, Deuteronomy was written to the nation of Israel as they were being established as God's people to give them uh, rules or uh, the foundation, the law, so that they may understand the holiness of God. And so in Deuteronomy, we'll begin in Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning with verse 9, is the first passage I want to share with you. I'm getting a feedback up here, by the way. It's kind of reverberating a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. It says, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on earth, and that they may teach their children so. The primary command here is to take care, to be careful, to keep your soul diligently or to watch yourself closely. Why does he say, watch yourself closely? Why does he say, take care or be careful? He closed out that, that passage with, so that you will not forget what you have seen, unless they depart from your heart. As God interacts with his people, he has a primary concern that they do not lose faith, that they do not lose hope, that they do not forget. Now, I don't know about you, but if I go a while without really tending to my soul diligently, I will find that I am consumed with the things of the world. Not in a bad, evil way, but just in a kind of, you know, cultural way. That I can become distracted from doing that which is best. That when I pass people, that I treat them uh, with a selfish point of view instead of a God-centered point of view. If we go days and days and days without tending to our soul, what we will find is that our love for the Lord can grow cold. And so the warning is very clear that the people of God are to not forget what they have seen, that they are to not forget how they have seen the Lord provide, how they have seen the Lord move, and that they would tell their children these things. So it is important in our calling as parents that we understand that we are called to disciple our children, to teach our children, to share with our children the goodness of God so that they would be encouraged to have faith in him. He said, teach, to, teach what you have seen and heard to your children so that they may learn to fear God and that they may teach their children also. Part of the, the great commandment, part of the God's plan for spreading the gospel, a massive part of God's plan for spreading the gospel is that parents would disciple their children that parents would teach their children to fear God. 
that parents would share with their children the ways in which God has blessed them. Let's skip over two chapters to Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. It's a famous passage of scripture which you will probably instantly recognize. But it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. I see two commands in here. The first command is this. To love the Lord with everything that you have. To love the Lord with everything that you have. One of the reasons this this passage may sound familiar to you because it was quoted by Jesus. When he was in teaching his disciples how to worship. Love the Lord with everything you have. The second command is this. Diligently teach your children about the Lord. He says to talk of him when you sit walk, lie down, and rise. Bind them on their wrist. Write them on their foreheads. These commands were the most important commands for God's chosen people. Though thousands of years have passed since that time, I don't think that this has changed much. I believe we still are called primarily to love the Lord with all that we have and to teach our children to do the same. You see, God was jealous of the worship of his creation, and he still is. The Bible instructs all godly parents to teach our children to treasure Christ above everything else. Now, I want to pause before we continue and just say this so that it's on the table. I know godly men and women who have diligently discipled their kids, and their kids do not like Jesus Christ. I know ungodly men and women who never shared anything about Jesus with their kids and their kids dearly love the Lord. And so I'm not saying that these are a guarantee that if we disciple our kids that our kids will walk straight with the Lord. But I am saying and I believe the Bible promises that we lay a foundation for understanding God and for understanding faith by the way in which we parent our children. And so the Bible speaks of three main ways in which parents are to teach their children. The first is this. We teach by our example. We teach by the way we live. We teach by the way that we serve the Lord. We teach by the way that we study the scripture. We teach primarily by our example. Both passages command parents to teach their children about what they have seen and heard from the Lord in order for us to diligently obey this command. We must strive to be an example. And I've got four things that I've tried to do in my own life that I've tried to pay attention to in my own life that I want to be an example by having an active and growing faith. One of the first and primary ways in which I can be an example to my kids of the Lord Jesus Christ is by communing with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is difficult to pass along that which we have not experienced than that which we do not know. So I want to have an active and growing faith. I do not want to neglect spending time with the Lord. The time that I can spend in God's word is incredible. I have never, there have been a lot of times that I did not want to spend time in God's word. But I have never spent time in God's word and walked away going, well, that was a waste. Never happened. I always leave God's word energized, instructed, convicted about what God is doing and has called us to do. What a great reminder to get up each morning and to remember that a loving Savior died for us. That we would not have to die for our sins. I 
in the daily reminding of that, I want to live for him. So we can be an example by having an active and growing faith. Secondly, I want to be an example, and I try to be an example by spending time with my children. It is difficult for me to be an example for my children if I'm not around my children. There's a lot of times I don't want to be around my children, but when I am around my children, I am mindful of the fact that God has called me to something far greater than yelling and screaming at them. I have a much deeper calling than to simply make my children obey me. I was a youth pastor for 28 years. And so I've seen thousands of kids all that time and worked with them, sharing the gospel, teaching the scriptures. And I can tell you that one of the biggest hindrances to a kid's walk with the Lord is the fact that their parents seem to hate them. Now, we know that's not true. I mean, I'm sure my kids at times have thought, well, my dad hates me. So I know that you don't hate your kids. But when we do not spend time with them, when we do not enjoy their company, they can get the impression that we don't like them. Do not underestimate the power of your influence in the lives of your children. Yes, I know that people tell us that, that peers are a great influencer of their children. But I'm going to tell you that my observation has been that parents are the greatest influencer of their children. The way we love our children, the foundation that we lay for them, I find has the greatest influence even among teenagers. Though your teenager may not want you to know that. Have fun with your kids. Enjoy your children. Be attentive to the opportunities to be able to share biblical truth as you walk through life together. This is one of the things that takes place when we can be with our kids is that we get to experience the richness of fellowship with our children. We have opportunities to be able to share the gospel and share about God as we walk with them. Spending time is valuable and being an example to our children. The third thing is this, to model a genuine faith to our children. Model a genuine faith to our children. Actively living before your kids as Christ followers gives credibility to what you say about God. The example that we set as parents will be the primary means by which our kids will measure the truth and the power of the gospel, either in positive ways or negative ways. Model a genuine faith. You know what the great thing is about a genuine faith? Is that a genuine faith is not a perfect faith. A genuine faith is an honest faith that says, I messed up, that says, I sinned, please forgive me. That's a genuine faith. A genuine faith is a, a man or a woman who, who lives honestly before God, whose primary concern with their day is that they please God. The fourth way that I've tried to be an example is to be willing to talk about my faith to my children. This is difficult. I talk to husbands and wives and have difficulty praying together because they've not prayed together. It's an awkward thing when you begin a new habit like this to pray with your spouse. Should not be an awkward thing, right? It should be a very natural thing. But it can be for many people, particularly when beginning healthy biblical habits. It can be difficult to pray over your child, to pray a blessing over your child. It can be difficult to talk about our own faith and struggles, to be able to even share our testimony with our children. Some of us feel very guilty about the way we live our lives, and it hinders us from speaking truth of the gospel to our children. I just want to encourage you to, if you've been like this, just to apologize to your children, repent before your children. Say, I'm really sorry that I, I haven't shared this before. This is the most important thing in my life, and I haven't acted like it. It's amazing what simple and clear truth can do in our relationships with the people around us. 
So we must teach them by being an example to them. I just do not think there's any greater influence for Christ in a child's life than the example of godly parents. The second way that we teach our children, that we are called to teach our children, is by instruction. In both of these passages, we see the command to verbalize the truth. In the first passage, we are given reasons for teaching our children. It said, make testimony of God known. Make our testimony of God known. In other words, make our experience with God apparent. Speak about it. So that our children may fear God. Fear is a reverence and a respect that they may hold such high esteem of God that they do not choose to live life contrary to his ways. And do it so that they may teach their children's children. So there is a passing of the gospel through the way in which we live. And we are to give instruction in order that this happens. In the second passage, we are told to teach and how to teach. It says, teach them to love the Lord with everything that they have. Teach them diligently at all times. And he goes into very specific ways. When you sit in your house... When you walk by the way, or for us, we walk down the street. When you lie down and when you rise, they are told to bind them on their wrist so that everything that they do with their hands, they are constantly reminded of who the Lord is and who they are in the Lord. They're to wear them between their eyes, almost a, a headband of the reminder that when you're speaking to other people and when you're dealing with other people, that there is a a holiness and a foundation there of God. And they are to write them on the doorpost and their gates so that all who enter may know that they serve God. Since the calling is to love the Lord, and I, I think this is important, I want to emphasize this, the calling is for our children to love the Lord. We must be careful not to emphasize rules and obedience to our rules at the expense of teaching our children to love God. Now, I'm not saying don't have rules for your kids, and I'm not saying don't enforce the rules for your kids. Of course, that's extremely important. But don't so emphasize, overemphasize rules that our children leave our house thinking that following God is obeying a set of rules. Because it's not, it's a relationship with the Lord. The Bible teaches us that, the, that behavior is simply an expression of what, it is, of what is in the human heart. Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this is what I want us to pull away from here. When we are around our children and they are speaking of things, they are living in certain ways, it is, it is God's way of helping us know what they treasure in their hearts. And sometimes... We can so demand that the rules be followed that we no longer get a correct temperature of their heart. I hope that makes sense. The morning crew is dead. <laughs> Which is funny because in the school year, the morning crew is alive. And I guess all those people just sleep in and get more rest. They can be more alive in the second service. I'm not disparaging you. Don't hate me. <laughs> so when we see our children misbehaving, we do need to correct them. But we do not correct them in such a way that we make suppressing what is in their heart the primary goal over changing what is in their heart. Study your children. Study what they love, what they talk about, what they value, so that you may know how to adapt your, your teaching of the gospel to them 
so that it reaches their heart. Their actions and their words show us what our kids treasure, and our kids mostly treasure themselves. Our parenting is not primarily about behavior modification. Ultimately, our, our parenting is about reaching the hearts of our children with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just because we have kids that are obedient do not, does not mean that we have kids that love Jesus. How do we do this? We do this by connecting our instruction to biblical principles that show them the ultimate purpose of what we are trying to teach them. Mostly, we are teaching them to find satisfaction in the infinitely valuable and holy God who gave his perfect son to redeem them from the internal damnation that they have earned because of their sin. Or an easy way to say that is we want to teach them to treasure Jesus. I know that's a quite a nebulous concept. I love the book of Ephesians because the book of Ephesians, Paul takes the first two chapters and he gives this incredible doctrinal truth about who we are in Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you read the first two chapters of Ephesians, it's easy to get overwhelmed with the grace of God. In chapter 3, Paul prays for us. He prays for the readers of his letter that they may know Jesus, that they may be softened softened toward the gospel, that may be strengthened to endure faith. The last three chapters, he gives a bunch of commands. But the commands, what he did was he couched the commands in who we are in Jesus Christ. So that it's not just do this, do this, do this, and don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do this. But he says, this is who you are. So this is what it should look like. This is what people who have been redeemed, this is how they live in such a way as to express worship to the Lord. And that's the same thing we ought to do with our parenting. Our parenting ought to emphasize the goodness and the glory and the, the, the treasure that Jesus Christ is. Our parenting ought to be about teaching our children that their only satisfaction is going to be found in surrender to Christ. And then, when we lay that foundation, we couch the commands of Scripture in that who they are. You are this way, and this is how people like that live. We've heard Pat say, you know, you're a howl, and a howl does this. And that's the principle we're talking about. You are a Christ follower. This is what a Christ follower looks like. And so I try to tell my kids, you know, you've been set apart to honor God. That is a high calling. The way you're living is far below that. So I'm challenging my kids with what it looks like to treasure Jesus. Because, honestly, when we sin, it is because we're living other than who we are in Jesus. What's so horrible about sin is not simply the consequences of it. What's horrible is what it says about our heart, about the value, the way in which we value or do not value the Lord. And what is he worth? And so we establish a foundation of worth of Christ, and then we encourage our kids from there with the, with the rules. But our goal is not for them to follow the rules. Our goal is for them to understand their identity in Jesus Christ. Paul helps us understand that when he says in Ephesians 4.1, which is the, that hinge verse between his, his doctrine of who we are, his prayer for us, And the commands that he gives us, that hinge verse is this. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. See, Paul transitions to commands by saying, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You have been called to greatness. 
because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can we shoot for that? Can we shoot for being a man or a woman of honor? We must help our kids understand that the commands of Scripture are not there so that a mean God can get thrills from bossing people around. That's not God's motive. They are there so that we might know true joy and so that we will not go to hell by chasing after our fleshly desires. We must continually teach our children that God deserves to be their treasure because he is the only thing The only thing in this world of infinite worth. He's the only thing in this world that will not perish. And he is the only thing in this world that will completely satisfy their souls. When we see people seeking after sin, what we see is people who are not satisfied with the thing that can satisfy them. And so they go from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. Looking for satisfaction. And it never satisfies. We should think through the instructions that we give in the light of the gospel. Not only would this help add meaning to our instruction, but it might also help to us to reevaluate the rules that we have. And we may even see a need to change or to drop some of those rules. So we are called to teach by our instruction. Number three, we are called to teach by discipline. And Pat went into one area of this in his sermon, but I want to go to the other side of it and cover a couple of other areas here. We teach by discipline. So the root of the word, discipline is the root of the word discipleship. Discipline is the means by which we teach our children self-control. It is training our children to bring their fleshly desires under the control of their will. Hopefully with the fact that the Holy Spirit is in control of their will. So as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching... To others, I myself should be disqualified. God has given us the responsibility to train our children through discipline. So I talk with my kids regularly about battling their feelings with truth. So we get up in the morning, we experience something, and we respond to that something by how we feel, right? I'm angry about what you said, therefore I will respond to you in anger. I'm sad by what you, so I'm going to respond to you with sadness. And what I try to help, and some of my kids are good at this, others are not. Because we have some emotional children and we have some kids that are just like, you know, you're checking their wrist for a pulse half the time. But I was talking to one of my emotional children and I was saying... Listen, you need to get control of your feelings. I know you feel this, and I know you feel, it, you feel it very real. Our feelings are extremely real to us. But if you don't get this under control, it's going to be a horrible slave master for you the rest of your life. And it's going to lead you to places that you don't want to go. When we do not apply truth to our feelings... We have horrible results. See society, right? Take a look around. Take a look around you. Read your Facebook page. It's covered with people who have no self-control on their feelings. So teaching our children to bring their feelings under the control of the Spirit and the truth of God's Word is one of the greatest gifts that we can offer them as a parent. Is one of the best ways that we can help our children avoid a life of misery. So I'll say, you feel this and I understand and that feeling is very real. But what is the truth? 
The truth is that that person made you mad, but that person has no authority in your life. So take a step back and just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. And then move on with life. But do not allow somebody else's immaturity or ignorance to cause you to react in sinful ways. You take the truth of God's word. I, I feel this way. I'm defending myself because my value and my worth is based on how I perform in this area. And when somebody does better than me, I hate them. That's not your worth and value. Your worth and value is not tied to your performance. In Christ, your worth and value is tied to the value and worth of Jesus Christ. And so we must teach our children to moderate their feelings. Yes, they're going to feel those things, but you do not have to act on those feelings. You bring them under the control of Christ. I want to share a couple of passages that I think illustrate the devastation of a lack of discipline. In the first example, King David's fourth son, Adonijah, was undisciplined and exalted himself as, as king after David had already declared that Solomon would be king. In the end, Adonijah suffered great shame, though his life was spared. So look at what is said as the reason for his rebellion. In 1 Kings chapter 1, beginning with verse 5. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. His father, which was King David, had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? Daz, when's the last time you displeased your son by asking a question? You question his motives, but you question his behavior. Moms, when's the last time you have, have questioned your children in such a way? I pray that we do not have parents in here that fear their kids. Or who are so consumed with their self that they do not want trouble with their kids. God has called us to help our children understand him. And I don't know about you, but God is always up in my life doing stuff. In the second narrative which resulted in the death of the sons of Eli. But listen to the curse. So God had raised up Samuel to pronounce a curse over the house of Eli. And you can read this story uh, for yourself in 1 Samuel chapter 3. But I just want to share with you verse 13, which I think gets to the point. And I declare to him, speaking of Eli, and I declare to Eli that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Yes, the Lord pronounced judgment on the sons for blaspheming God, but he indicates that the reason for this is because they had a father that did not restrain them. A father that did not teach them Throughout the scriptures, it's very clear about the calling on parents to discipline our children. In Proverbs 13, 24, I had to reference our old wooden paddle for these verses. We had paddle and verses written on them. It's a lot of fun for our children. Balsa wood, very low wind resistance. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. Proverbs twenty two fifteen, 
Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 17. Discipline your son, and he will give you rest. He will give delight to your heart. And the last verse one of my favorite maybe you should make a plaque for your child's door and I would suggest to Brandy we can do this for our next t-shirt mission fundraiser Proverbs 30 17 the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother will be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures I actually had that as a bedtime story one night for my boys you better sleep with your eyes closed tight, 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 because you've been really disobedient. <laughs> Discipline is a foreign concept in our culture. Our culture is taught to that whatever they feel is reality. Whatever they feel is reality. And that they have a right to their reality. The problem is, Billions of people can live with a right to the reality God hasn't changed once. He is still the ruler of this world. He is still the king and the final judge that sits on his throne. And it does not matter, and I say this to people all the time, when, especially when I get into theological arguments, it does not matter what you and I believe. It does not matter that you and I I'm not trying to win my argument. I want to know Jesus, and I want to live that way. It doesn't matter. You argue one thing, and I argue a different thing. And my point is, winning an argument will never change the character and nature of God. But just because we have a culture of short-sighted people who do not understand the grave consequences of not disciplining children and not submitting to the Lord does not mean that we have to be a culture of people who are short-sighted and do not understand the grave consequences. And I want to be clear, I've read and talked and joked about spanking, but I don't think that spanking is a very effective uh, form of discipline. It has its place with a a tiny pop to get a child's attention uh, on a rear end, never to inflict pain, but to get their attention and to snap them out of where they are. But we must be diligent to look for the ways in which we can discipline our children. And as they get older and we're trying to transition children to being adults, I really have, have recommended us finding Uh, penalties that match their decisions so consequences that match their decisions so if they don't do this then this doesn't happen for them and I've tried to make sure that they understand this is not about violating dad's rule you made a decision that decision was a a bad decision and here are the consequences I'm sorry you did that, and I'm sorry that you don't get to experience this joy this week. That way they understand that this is your fault, not mine. It's not my fault for writing a rule. It's your fault because you made bad choices. And in doing that kind of discipline, we can help our children understand that they will always have consequences for the way in which they live their life. There are eternal consequences for the way in which they live their life. But there's also immediate, temporary consequences in this world. And so knowing the best way to restrain the evil desires of the children, or or helping our children restrain their own evil desires, and then consistently and diligently training them to have self-control. I wonder what King David would have done differently... Had he been able to see the the 
heartache and the trauma that his children would have caused. If Eli would have known his lack of discipline would result in God killing his sons and punishing his house forever, perhaps he would have been more eager to restrain his sons. So we must discipline our children so that we do not do, as Solomon says, and set our hearts on putting them to death. Our busyness in life and our weariness in parenting and desires as parents to have me time must not override our calling to disciple our children. I understand because I'm, I'm as selfish as anybody else about their time and about what they want to do. And, you know, you have hopes and dreams of uh, sitting in the recliner and watching Undisturbed of your favorite show. And I know very well that parenting is a tremendous amount of work. And it's continuous work. It's emotionally draining. It's physically draining. But the benefits are worth it. Engaging in our children with the gospel creates children who I thoroughly enjoy being around. I love my family. I love my kids. I enjoy my kids. Which is good because they're all there. <laughs> all the time. I love the opportunities we have. I, I love looking for ways to encourage them with the gospel. I love spending time with them. I love playing games with them. I love trying to figure out a way to communicate with them that I enjoy you, that I love you, that I'm honored to be your father. And so I just challenge you to not be satisfied with temporary happiness, but that you would have as a goal, particularly in the parenting of your children, that you would have as your goal to help them see and honor and treasure Jesus Christ above everything else. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for my children. I thank you for the joys and the trials. I thank you for the ways in which they've helped me to be a better Christian. I particularly thank you, Lord, for your patience with me as a father. And I ask that you would continue to give me grace on a daily basis to please you with that role and that job. And I pray, Lord, for the men and women in this room. That you would give them a large vision for what it means to be a mom and dad who teaches their child to love Jesus Christ above all else. Lord, may we influence our children for the kingdom of Christ. That they may live in such a way as to communicate the gospel to the people around them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.